Testing, testing. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here at the Brock Prize Symposium. I'm Ed Harris. I'm administrator of the Brock Prize. Three university par partner with the prize, uh, OSU, University of Oklahoma, and the University of Tulsa. These institutions partner and alternate hosting the symposium. The Brock Prize Symposium this year is hosted by, obviously, Oklahoma State University. So to give you an official OSU welcome, I'd like to introduce you to Dean John Peterson, Dean uh, of OSU's College of Education and Human Sciences. So Dean Peterson, would you come up, please? Good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here today. Certainly very excited to issue a welcome from Oklahoma State University and certainly our College of Education and Human Sciences. I, I do want to just say thank you for all for showing up. Thank you to the Brock Foundation, John Brock, for doing this uh, wonderful thing in, in the Brock Prize. It certainly is a marvelous thing that I followed uh, for more than 20 years. And uh, to Dr. Uh, Mitra, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to an engaging conversation and to our panelists as well. And, and uh, Dr. Harris, as always, thank you so much. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Uh, there's another person I'd like to introduce before we get going, and that if it weren't for this person, we wouldn't be here right now because there would not be a Brock Prize. Y'all would be doing something else. Uh, but because we're here, it's because of John Brock. And through word and deed, John has demonstrated that he loves to improve society, and he believes that the best way to do that is through education. So, John, would you please wave? Sitting right here. Before we get started with our, our program, I have a few quick announcements for our live and virtual audiences. We are live streaming right now, and so I welcome you, uh, live audience. I also welcome our virtual audi audience around the world. Uh, following Dr. Mitra's presentation, there will be a panel discussion and a time for question and answer with a group of educators who have put Dr. Mitra's ideas into practice. To submit a question at any time, simply text or email us following the instructions at the bottom of the screen. For those of you at the live event, instructions are also printed on the cards you find in your seat. And you may begin submitting your questions at any time. So first of all, some of you may be here and not familiar with the Brock Prize in Education Innovation. The, the Brock Prize is unique because we celebrate and award big ideas. And as if you've been in education for a while, you know that a lot of ideas come and go in education. And we're not interested in all the ideas. We're interested in those that make a difference. And those that make a difference have impact on society because, as John believes, I do too, education is one of the best ways to improve society and make this world a better place. So it's not just about the idea, it's about an idea that makes a change in the way we think and the way we act. And we would like to share those ideas with the world and that's why we're here today. And so before we begin, as a segue into our conversation, our friends at, at Port Space Productions Company have put together a video about the prize. So I'd like us to just watch that video and learn a little bit more about the Brock Prize in Education Innovation. I've always believed that the most important thing that we do in this life is to educate our children. And to ensure that every child gets a great education. If our species ever stops doing that, we know what the future will look like. Brock Prize discovers new ideas in education and spends the time and the effort to pass those ideas on to politicians, educators, and people around the world who are interested in education. The Brock Prize 
finds those people who have developed and proven new ideas in education and awards them for doing that. From its inception, Owen was designed to be um, essentially an educational laboratory where experimentation was important. So we did all kinds of things to try to answer two questions. What does it mean to be an engineer in the 21st century? And what does it mean to be educated in the 21st century? Both of those things are changing rapidly. Engineering is not a body of knowledge. Engineering is a process. The education system we have today is built on the idea of transferring knowledge and skill. And it was invented a thousand years ago. It's not what you know that matters, it's what you can do with what you know that matters. It's found conceiving now. What can you imagine that doesn't exist today, that the world needs? This is what we need to be teaching. It's going to require a new way of thinking. I think more than ever, it's important to create an education where every single child and every single teacher are change makers. One of the things that inspires me about the Brock Prize is this notion of innovation and of continuing to find new innovations that are having an impact um, across the country and across the world. You know, when we started the New Teacher Center, we were losing 50% of all new teachers in the first three years. And what we found is they leave because they feel isolated. They were just given the keys to the classroom and told to go at it and no real support. At the New Teacher Center, we focused on uh, mentoring brand new teachers. And our role in partnership with the school district was to actually teach the mentors how to be effective at mentoring. Because, you know, there's no room for uneducated kids. Why doesn't our society value education more? I think we take it for granted. The most important thing is changing the culture from a negative culture to a positive culture. The Brock Prize love teachers. They just put teachers up on pedestals, and I feel like teachers are the real rock stars in our country. I think it's just inspiring on one level, right, to see a man and his wife honoring innovation in the teaching space. In the end, the Brock Prize changed, I don't think this is too much of a statement, I think it changed who I am. It inspired me to look beyond undergraduate engineering education, which is what Olin is about. It inspired me to think more broadly about the mission of education in society and what I should be doing with the rest of my life in order to address that. Okay, Port Space will give you a round of applause. As you can see from the video, and uh, innovation is not just creating something out of nothing, but it's rather recombining, repurposing ideas, resources into something that will better society. And as we see here with the light bulbs and that I can't avoid right now, that how that those have evolved the last hundred years into one that, that may only last uh, 20 minutes to one that will last this entire symposium and longer. So that's what we're about, and we're about bettering society. So now to hear what you've come to hear. I'd like to invite Jeff McClellan to the stage to introduce Dr. Mitra. Jeff is the junior is a juror who nominated Sugata and is founder and CEO of StartSoul.org, a community and resource and tool, three things, for implementing self-organized learning environments. Jeff became the founding director of StartSoul in 2015 after founding MC Squared STEM High School in the Cleveland metropolitan area. Now, as the work that Sugata and Jeff is doing Seoul is in over 130 countries. So when you think about impact, we're impacting lives, or they're impacting lives in 130 countries, including 
almost every state, in fact, Jeff may correct me, but every state in the U.S. So, Jeff, we're honored to have you here, and would you please come and introduce Dr. Sugata Mitra? Thank you. I'm grateful for the opportunity to introduce Dr. Mitra to you today. Sugata Mitra is a physicist, a computer scientist, and a thought leader who is well known for his 2013 TED Talk, Build a School in the Cloud. His talk won the first million dollar TED Prize and has currently been viewed by over 3.7 million people. His research has impacted countless educators and policymakers around the globe and was even the inspiration for the Oscar winning movie, Slumdog Millionaire. I could spend the next five minutes sharing with you Sagata's extremely extensive and impressive bio, noting all of his contributions to the field of physics, computer science, and education. But I'll leave that to you to Google. Instead, I'm going to tell you a story about what Sagata has meant to me in my journey as an educator. In 2016, I became one of the bazillion people who had seen Sagata's TED Talk and was immediately inspired by the elegance and simplicity of soul, self-organized learning environments. His talk came at a very important time in my life as I was serving as the founding head of an innovative STEM high school in Cleveland, Ohio, and helping other educators find ways to build their own student-centered learning environments. After watching Sagata's TED Talk, I found his contact information and reached out to him. He responded to me very enthusiastically, and that was the beginning of our relationship. Sugata was not at all what I expected from someone who had won so many awards. I tiptoed into our first conversation, afraid to trigger what I assumed was a big ego. Instead, what I was met with was a warm, caring individual who seemed as curious to meet me as I was to meet him. Sagata willingly shared papers with me and introduced me to people in his network. Imagine my elation to receive a file of papers written and published by Sagata Mitra and warm introductions to the, from the man himself to other educators around the world. Each person he introduced me to had the same open collaborative spirit and general understanding that soul is the answer to what kids and adults need the educational system to be like. My relationship with Sagata grew as my commitment to spreading soul grew. If you've Googled Sugato already, you know what a big deal he was by 2016. Even though Sugato was rubbing elbows with kings of countries and speaking in some of the most prestigious venues around the world, he still found time to spend a few nights with us in luxurious Holiday Inn Express in Cleveland, Ohio. And what I learned is he still has time for countless educators like me all over the world. Today's Start Soul supports 40,000 educators in over 130 countries, impacting roughly 3 million individuals. But I'm not alone. Sagata has impacted thousands of educators like myself, uh, impacting unknown numbers of students and educators around the world. This is why I'm grateful for the opportunity to introduce you to the 2022 Brock Prize for Innovation recipient in education, Dr. Sagata Mitra. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, and uh, what an honor to receive this uh, famous prize. You know, when I was told that I would get the prize, I kind of uh, sat back and thought, um, why? Somebody must have you know, looked at what I'd done and somebody figured that uh, it was uh, worthwhile to give me this prize. So, when I'm standing here now to accept this honor, um, I, I thought to myself, uh, what should I say? And I realized that in almost any audience that I have spoken to anywhere, there are uh, two kinds of people. One, who already know what my work is about, and the other, who don't. 
<laughs> so, so, so if I if I say here is what I'm doing now, then the guys who don't know anything about my work will say, well, what did you do before? <laughs> and if I were to start from where I had started from, then uh, and, and and stop at now, uh, then the guys who know what I'd already done uh, would say, not again. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> it's a bit of a dilemma, you know, and it doesn't get any easier with time because the volume of work keeps growing. So, in what I'm going to say, is in two two parts. One part necessarily has to be, what is this work that the that the Brock uh, Prize was given for? Uh, what exactly did I do? The second is something I haven't done before, and I do it with some hesitation. I normally, you know, report research results, and I don't comment about so what. I normally simply say, this is what I did, and this is what I saw. That's all. I think that's how science should be done. But for this occasion, I decided to take the plunge and have a part of this lecture where I would say, this is what is going to happen to education over the next 10 to 30 years' time. Whether you're a student, whether you're a teacher, or whether you're a parent, I think you need to um, listen to that bit, not necessarily to agree, but to imagine what if that were to be true. So let's, uh, let's go there. It all started in 1999, you know, approximately similar to the time frame that the Brock Prize itself started in. The prize, as you just heard, was for ideas that make a change. In 1999, I had done an experiment which um, was simply to answer a, a, a question for myself. Uh, the question was, do children need to be taught how to use a computer? I mean, you might, you might say, what kind of question is that in, 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 but in 2022? But back then, in 1999, it was a question. It was a very important question. And there were organizations that would charge people to learn how to use a computer. Some of you may actually remember that. You know, there, there, were, there were lectures where a, a lecturer would say, um, this is called a mouse, <laughs> and that kind of thing. So um, as long as you needed those courses, um, poor people's children, children who could not afford those courses, would not know what a computer was or how to use it. This was the assumption. I wanted to test that assumption with a very simple experiment. What would happen if I took a computer and I put it literally in the street? Well, people said the obvious, it'll be broken and stolen. <laughs> okay. And that's you know, a universal truth. I mean, if I take a laptop from one of your, your laptops, not mine, and I, <laughs> and I put it out there on the street in OSU, how many minutes do you think it'll last? OK, so, uh, so I said, no, I'm not going to do it that way. I'm going to embed it into a wall, some kind of a public wall somewhere, somewhat like a bank ATM, so that it can't be broken and stolen so easily. And then I'm going to see what happens. And people said, well, I mean, you just want to make children feel embarrassed because they will come there and these are Indian slum children in New Delhi in 1999. They don't know a word of English. They don't know, never seen a computer before. They've never heard of the internet. What are you expecting to achieve? And I said, uh, if I knew that, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> it turned out to be an experiment that was called 
the hole in the wall. I, uh, for this talk, I fished out uh, pieces of old videos from 1999. You'll be able to tell that the cameras were you know, different then. <laughs> they're, they're spliced together. Um, uh, there uh, are a few where there are flashing images. I'm sorry about that. But you know, those were the dates when uh, the camera frequency and the computer's frequency wouldn't match. So if you filmed a computer, you would see the screen flickering. Okay, there are a few pieces like that. But uh, it, uh, I think you'll, uh, you'll like this piece because um, it, it'll, it'll show you what actually happened. Here we go, it's about a minute and a half or something. I told you about the flashing images, be careful there. The sound comes and goes. This is the first day at the hole in the wall. On the right is an eight-year-old doesn't go to school, barely goes to school. To his left, his student, she is six. And he was teaching her how to browse. So, you, you get a sense of, of, of that time. They, would, they were downloading games, installing them, and playing them. Now, you know now, if you've watched a, a, a four-year-old with an iPad, you know what happens. But back then, nobody knew. So everybody asked me, who taught them? And I said, I don't know. But I knew, though, I, I knew nobody taught them. And I also knew that you can't say that. <laughs> okay. It took people a few years to figure out. Then they said, nobody is teaching these children. They're learning this stuff by themselves. I, uh, I studied it very carefully, as carefully as I could. I measured it. I got funding to do the, repeat this experiment uh, all over length and breadth of India, Cambodia. The South African government repeated it. And finally, we got three publications uh, where we said, where, where we said to peer reviewers uh, approval that children, groups of children, given the internet, could learn things by themselves. Okay, uh, if you look at this, uh, the by themselves, why have I put that in big letters? Because you know I've been a teacher all my life. Um, so when I wrote that line, and I highlighted it, and I said, we'll up the point size by themselves. In 2006, um, the University of Newcastle, Newcastle University in uh, England, invited me uh, to a professorship over there. And uh, I went, taking the hole-in-the-wall data with me. Uh, when, I, when I arrived in England, some school teachers came and said, you know, uh, why don't you do the hole-in-the-wall experiment here in England? And I said, no, I, I won't. And uh, they said, why not? And I said, because, uh, you know, the kind of weather you have in England, um, you'll get frozen children. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I can't do it. So they said, no, come on, I mean, be serious, do something. I said, well, all right. I moved the hole in the wall into the classroom. It's very easy to do. You take any classroom, it doesn't matter what it looks like. Let's say it has 20 children. Put in about four or five computers in it. Why four or five? Because you want them to crowd around the computer. Remember the hole in the wall? 
It's that crowding which was doing the teaching. The, the un, unseen teacher was the group. We did that, and uh, the teachers said, this produces learning. I mean, it's like a lesson which comes out of nowhere. I said, well, not exactly nowhere. It comes out of the internet, um, triggered off by a question. You ask the question, you tell the children, uh, you know, children would then, uh, then say, well, what's the answer? You say, I don't know. Um, try and ask a question like that, which genuinely you don't know the answer to. And the children say, you don't know, so what happens next? So you say, well, you, you figure it out and you tell me. That's all there is to this. We gave it a name. We called it Self-Organized Learning Environment, an S-O-L-E. So. If you do it, then you lose. Okay, well, I'll, I'll explain a little bit example. Let's start now. Okay, so uh, you're a mixed you one. One. Big. Uh, yeah. And he wants to get richer. More richer. And how everyone will go in first. A personal art covers a wide went everywhere, all over the world, and it always worked. In the words of an Australian school principal, he said, one of the things about a soul is that it looks identical wherever you do it, you know. And by, then, uh, by this time, I'd been traveling all over the place. I'd been asking children some really difficult questions, and always we would get back the answer. I tested uh, how much of this they would remember and discovered that they would remember it for, for a very long time, forever, because they had found it. Nobody ever told them. They, they discovered this. They go home and they would tell their parents, uh, Professor Mitra didn't know the answer. Uh, we told him. Okay. And uh, that kind of thing. So, um, so souls began to get acceptance. Even in a country like England, which is you know, steeped in a 600-year-old education system, teachers would say, um, this is rather nice. You know, If I come to school uh, not having prepared for a lesson, we can always do a sugata. <laughs> so, <laughs> which was exactly my point, that what do you do today if the history teacher is absent is that you put a you know, a replacement teacher, or you ask the math teacher, okay, uh, go and do some math. In the soul, you can ask the math teacher, go and do some history. And the math teacher says, oh, uh, what, what about, I mean, what am I supposed to do? I said, call the sick history teacher at home and ask her, what's the question? That's all. Then ask it and wait. You'll learn some history. <laughs> okay, so that was how souls began to spread everywhere. I kept on publishing. It was very important to publish. I mean, I'm, I'm not showing off why we're putting all those papers up, only because to show that these are all international peer-reviewed publications. If you don't do that, nobody will believe it. And nobody will accept that this is usable. By about 2012, I 
got this conclusion. Groups of people using the internet can solve most problems by themselves. I know it sounds very big, very grand, but I have data, I have data for years and years of different kinds of people, different kind of questions, different age groups. We can do it because we've, we've, got, a, we've got a world where there's a metal and plastic little square which has something rather strange on its screen. It says, ask anything. You know, we take it for granted. Can you imagine what we've created? Ask anything. And you give that to children, they will ask. And if they ask, if they have interest, education will happen. In 2012, Nicholas Negroponte, the man who had founded the MIT Media Lab, contacted me and said, uh, come to MIT uh, for a year. I, I went. Uh, you know, Media Lab is, is, is a, you know, a, a great mecca for, for most scientists. Went and spent that year there. And uh, during that year, I wrote up these ideas and I got the, the TED Prize, you know, which was a uh, million dollars. So it was, uh, I was a bit stunned. I, I called my bank. You know, <laughs> and <laughs> And I said, this is for serious. <laughs> and they said, yeah, talk to a tax consultant. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so uh, what I proposed in the TED uh, talk in uh, Long Beach was that we built something called a school in the cloud. Uh, that's not a, uh, it's not a website. I said, bring the internet into educational institutions. Steep the internet into educational institutions into schools, into universities. If we have a network that, can, that has the, the, uh, the courage to say, ask anything, well, give it to the learners, let them ask. I built, with the money I had, I built seven of them. And, uh, well, I, here's, a, here's a quick look at one of these. This is in China. So that same old hole-in-the-wall idea, okay? One big computer, groups of children. Remember, the screen has to be big. Those, those little cell phone screens, they're dangerous. Because, you know, you can't have groups of children around them. Because a single child alone with that network, that gigantic network, I mean, you, you, you'd be daft to, to let that happen. Make the screen big, as big as your living room TV. Put it in your living room if you can, and ask the children to access the internet. Nothing will go wrong. I can give you a guarantee on that. More publications <laughs> about the school in the cloud. Not everything worked, but the pieces that did. At the end of it all, here is what I came to understand. Since people can learn things by themselves, since people can solve problems by themselves using the internet, provided they're in groups, what should we be looking for in students? I got three things, computing, comprehension, and communication. You should, you should be able to handle the device, but that we know is not a problem with children. Um, if you're able to handle the device, if you're able to ask the internet uh, the right kind of questions, can you comprehend the answer? Because it will give you a lot. Can you figure out which one's right, which one's wrong, which one should I focus on, where do I go next from there? That kind of comprehension. And finally, if you've understood, can you communicate that understanding to others? If a child or if a learner and do those three things, she or he can learn anything. You don't care about what degrees they have. You need to know if they can do those three things.
So, what's the good news, what's the bad news? What are the lessons I learned in all those years? The hole in the wall, it still continues. You know, there's an organization in India that still puts these into slums, into remotest areas of, the, of India. Over five million children have uh, met the internet. Who would have otherwise uh, never uh, seen a computer? The Granny Cloud opened in 2010. It's a group of mediators who would be on the internet, retired school teachers, and who could beam themselves into groups of children anywhere and ask a question. So they would, in effect, operate a soul. It started in 2010, closed down in 2022, because, you know, of an absolutely stupid thing that I ignored. Retired school teachers, usually around 65 or 70 years old, in about 20 years, they're 90. So where do we get the new ones from? <laughs> okay, But there are young people now into this, uh, new initiatives in Colombia and Germany uh, who are hoping to build a business model around it. We need a business model. I'm hopeless at doing that. They'll do it, and we'll get the, the granny cloud back. Self-organized learning environments spread through the whole world. Okay, they're, they're everywhere, and as you as you know from Jeff, uh, who started Start Soul, uh, he converted it into a kind of an enabler, an app uh, that teachers can use to to set up uh, Soul sessions. The teachers use them everywhere when they can. I'll, I'll expand on why I say when they can. The school in the cloud, well, it has a couple of interesting things about it. it. It exists in affluent schools as a curiosity, you know? I could build one in this university with a little bit of money. It would be there as a curiosity. Teachers will say, yeah, that's cool. Why is that? It survives only inside an institution and not inside the community. Why is that? Because the community says, where's the teacher? Where's the curriculum? What will the children do in an examination? It's not taken seriously because of exams. Where did exams come from? From the age we've just crossed, the age of empires. Okay? Until the exams change, the school in the cloud will remain a curiosity. What's an exam? Very recently in England, a little young man <laughs> in eight or nine 10 uh, told me, an exam is where they ask you questions, but they don't let you look at your phone. <laughs> I mean, how silly can it be? <laughs> so that little change has to come, you know. We have to give them their phones back and then ask them the question. So what's the future of learning? As I said, I will take the plunge and I'm going to tell you what I think is going to happen, okay? Here. Um, but I'm not going to sort of read out all of this. I'll give you the, the, the general gist of it. Teachers in schools don't need to belong anywhere. You don't have to, I'm a teacher in this school, in this university. I'm a student enrolled in that school, in that. You can be a teacher anywhere. You can be a student anywhere. The student needs to go on a learning journey. There will be a place on the internet which will be the uberization of education. You'll say, get me from here to there. Here's my credit card. The rest will take care of itself, OK? I hope there's somebody here who wants to build that. Um, uh, if that Uber of education has to be built. I know which country will build it. I'm standing in it right now. What will education be like? Whether we like it or not, okay? Whether if you're a parent or a teacher or whatever. The internet will come into the exam, okay? We can't stop it. The devices will get smaller, they will get invisible, they'll go inside their, they'll be transplanted inside their brains and so on and so forth. If you're writing an, a question for a test or an exam, you better 
assume the student has access to the internet. So what should you do? Ask a question to which no one knows the answer. Then the internet doesn't know either. Curriculum will become what learners need to know, not, not a list of stuff that we have learned in, in, in the past, you know. I mean, everyone in this room, I guess, has learned at some point in time how to solve a quadratic equation. And there are a few engineers who've actually, you know, used quadratic equations, but for the rest of us, the last quadratic equation you solved was the one which was testing if you knew how to solve them. <laughs> what was it for? Just in case, just in case as you walk out after this meeting, what if there's a ferocious quadratic equation waiting out there for you? <laughs> I mean, children don't pay attention to that sort of thing. And we say, well, you know, you've got attention deficit disorder and so on. So give them their phones back. It will all go away. <laughs> Teachers will ask questions instead of making lessons. The harder, the better. This, this morning, I, I went to a school called Drexel, and I asked a question. Okay, they were little, they were seven, eight years old or something like that. The question was, why, why, do, we have, why do human beings have two legs? You know, in, in the world, almost everything else has four legs, six legs, eight legs, 16 legs. Why only two for us? They gave us the answer in less than 25 minutes. I won't tell you the answer because, you know, you're grown up, you should know this. <laughs> <laughs> Finding out is what this new generation is all about. Just in time, not just in case. The system of teach, learn, and examine will reverse into question, investigate, learn. As I said, you need to measure only three things. So testing becomes really simple. Computing, comprehension, communication. Learners need to work in groups. Learners don't need to be taught what they can learn by themselves. I mean, how, how silly a sentence is that? Learners don't need to be taught what they can learn by themselves. Why on earth would you teach them if they can learn it by themselves? What can they learn by themselves? Well, you, I have some data. It says everything. You deal with that. Learners and teachers don't need to belong. OK, we need a new subject. In my time, it was physics, chemistry, mathematics, the arts, etc. You, you all know those. There are, there's a missing piece there, you know. This, this is that list. There should be a subject called the internet. If we live with it day and night, 24 by 7, we don't have that as a subject. You ask someone, you know, when you send a WhatsApp message, how does it get from one phone to another? And they say, oh, you know, servers. And you say, well, what, what's a server? Oh, you know, a server, you know, Google. You know, this, <laughs> I mean, they don't know. You, you ask, uh, so we've got to have a subject called the internet. Children have to learn about networks. Our lives are de you know, determined by networks. Why isn't it a subject in school? Self-organization. Whole of nature works like that. Where does a hurricane come from? How do earthquakes happen? Who makes these things happen? Nobody does. They happen. Self-organization. Emergent phenomena, when you have chaotic situations like we have in a world full of 8 billion people, then things emerge out of it, monsters and angels. It has a scientific name, emergent phenomenon. And finally, what physicists are struggling with, have been struggling with since the 1920s, the physics of uncertainty. You know, physicists hate to say this, but... We don't know. And what about the future of educational philosophy? Well, nobody even talks about it. Nobody talks about philosophy at all, you know. Nobody says, uh, what did, um, uh, for example, 
what did Immanuel Kant say about reasoning? A few people say, well, that guy, well, one sentence was one and a half pages long. <laughs> so, <laughs> we will never read him. So we've got to do something about that. You, know, you can't just let 2,000, 5,000 years of philosophy just go under the carpet and replaced by what? By a belief system caused by billions of people sending out Chinese whispers to each other? That's not, that's not a good way to grow up. So you need to know when you need to know. Not ahead of time, not just in case, but just in time. And so on. And finally, why, why do you need an education? I think the purpose of education is to enable people to live a happy, healthy, and useful life. Whatever will do that, that's education. To help as much as possible, and uh, they can endeavor uh, let me give you an intro to this because it's worth uh, listening. Uh, in 2002, I got, a, I got a message from Sir Arthur C. Clarke, you, you, you know, the, the science fiction writer, remember? 2001 Space Odyssey and so on. Arthur C. Clarke wanted to meet me. He was in Sri Lanka at that time. I was in India doing the hole in the wall. And, and he said, I want to meet this guy because this, uh, you know, this is a fascinating experiment. So I went to Sri Lanka. He was my hero. I described the experiment to him. And he said, you know, I wrote this story about a monolith, for those of you who remember. It's, uh, it's about a, a strange object and people sort of figuring it out by themselves. He said, I wrote this story about a monolith, but you actually made one. <laughs> and, and, and I said, sir, uh, is this education? And he told me this one sentence, which I quote everywhere. When children have interest, education happens as possible, and uh, they can endeavor uh, to help people because the children very quickly learn to navigate the web and find things which interest them. And when you've got interest, then you have education. So I'll leave it there with those words. All the best then. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mitra, for this thought-provoking presentation. At this time, I'd like to invite our panelists to come to the stage and actually invite some chairs to come up before that. Um, however, while the chairs are making their way up here, uh, I'd like to remind you that this is going to be sort of... A, this, is, this panel discussion, in a way, is a little bit um, like taking a chance that... that uh, Sugata was talking about. Usually during a panel discussion, it's very it's somewhat, even though it seems uh, uh, orchestrated, um, even though it seems unorchestrated, it's usually very precise, and almost every word is scripted. This is not the case in this panel discussion. Uh, it's going to be a panel discussion without a panel leader. Um, I am going to get the conversation going. And we're going to see what happens. We'll, we'll just see. I'm going to get the conversation going and sit down, okay? And then we'll just see what happens. But during this panel discussion, we'll accept questions for Dr. Dr. Mitra and the panel from our live and virtual audience. To submit a question, simply text or email us following the instructions at the bottom of the screen. For those of you at the live event, instructions are also printed on the handouts found on your seats at your seats. Your questions will be transmitted electronically to me. Uh, and at the end of the end of our unscripted panel discussion, um, I will ask the panelists, any panel, this including Dr. Mitra, uh, things that you would like to ask. Or we already have some. Some of you have already beamed in your, your questions. And those will get answered. So the first person I'd like to ask to come up is Jeff McClellan. Would you please come back up? I introduced him earlier. Our next two panelists actually are teachers. 
uh, who got to mention Drexel Academy. These are teachers at Drexel Academy who put this into work. And in fact, I need to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, about three years ago when, when Jeff was here last time, he visited Drexel Academy and just maybe he spent about an hour there. And he went over the principles of soul and what, what it is. Well, the teachers um, really put it into practice. And actually, there's the, many of the teachers that are there now weren't there when Jeff went there. But it's been carried on in every week. And this is, to our knowledge, this is the only school in Oklahoma that does that. But every week they have a, uh, every Friday from 9 to 10, they have soul. They have a soul session. And these two teachers that are up here are leading that, or will lead, or, or lead that session. First is uh, Tanner, Tana Henderson. And so, Tana, please come up here. She's a fifth grade teacher at Drexel Academy. Tana's parents were instrumental in, her getting, in getting her into education. Her dad is a retired Tulsa Public School administrator. Her mom is also a retired educator. Also, uh, we're proud to say that Tana is currently enrolled in our educational leadership master's program at OSU because she desires to be an elementary principal. So thank you, Tana, for being here. Our next panelist is Lenora Walton. And while Tana teaches fifth grade, Lenora teaches fourth grade at Drexel Academy. Uh, Lenora is a graduate of Oral Roberts University. One of the things that she said that she chose education was for a career because I wanted to make a difference in our future and our children are our future. And so we have some change makers up here that are actually doing what Sugata has been saying let's do for a long time. And our last panelist is Sugata himself. So please come up again. And again, so this is uh, the first time this has happened. I mean, this like this. In other words, we like things to be scripted. We don't like to take chances, but, but I'm going to take a chance. And uh, worst case scenario, we'll just edit this part of the video. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> so um, my first question and that will be to, to uh, Jeff. It will be the same question as Jeff, Tana, and Lenora. Why do you use soul? Why? Thanks, Ed. That's a good question. Thank you. Um, and I guess it goes back to uh, when I was introduced to Sagata's TED Talk and first uh, understood the concept of soul. I was the uh, principal of a... Uh, STEM high school in Cleveland, Ohio. It was a platform STEM high school, and we had things in place that people were visiting our school to see and wanting to implement in other environments. And I was working in Egypt on a system-wide STEM project. I was working with schools in Cleveland and other places, and what I was seeing was that we were making it too hard for people to implement student-centered inquiry in their environments. I was responsible for this and a lot of the other things that were out there. I just felt like we were asking teachers to you know, implement project-based learning models that were asking them to go from the ground floor to the, to the roof of a building without giving them an elevator or steps. And when I saw Sagata's uh, concept, you know, even though it's, it's extremely complicated uh, in terms of like what kids are doing, there's a beauty in the simplicity of the implementation of it. Literally, you, you take a big question, you engage kids in groups uh, with access to the internet with less technology than there are students in the groups, the bigger the screens, the better. You give them time to research the question, and then you have them present their findings. I mean, I looked at it, I said, you can do that in pretty much any classroom in America with a willing uh, instructor in the right question. And so for me, um, Soul was really about a way to create the opportunity for any educator anywhere to start to engage their kids in student-centered, uh, inquiry-based instruction. Uh, for me, uh, when Saul was introduced, when I first got to Drexel, I'm like, what is this? Kids were all over, running around, looking around. And once we practiced it more with the children, 
um, they enjoy it. They love learning from one another. Um, a lot of education takes place when students teach each other. Um, they love collaborating. Of course, they love socializing. So that's a good way for them to socialize and kind of critically think about what they're researching. Um, it also helps them to learn to be independent in their own learning. Mm -hmm. So the students do enjoy that. Um, yeah. Okay, um, when we got to Drexel, as Ms. Henderson said, we were introduced to Seoul. I use Seoul kind of piggybacking off for everything that she said. Um, it's helping the kids take an ownership of their learning. Like there is no right or wrong answer. So usually when students, where you're looking for that one right answer and they know they have it wrong, they immediately disengage. So the students are able to learn socially before you get that explicit instruction from a teacher because you can ask the student a question and they may already have prior knowledge to some of the questions that you're asking before they start doing the research. So it helps the kids be better presenters, critical thinkers, take ownership of their learning, and just to see them learn how to work together um, with other students as well, because that's something that they're going to have to do in their future when they leave um, the school. So that's why I use Soul as well. Great. So uh, I, I don't uh, use souls much, <laughs> <laughs> but I do. But I do watch very carefully when people such as these uh, use it because uh, there's so much I learn from the way they have approached uh, this uh, the, 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 this uh, you know method of teaching um, that it's uh, it, it helps me to amplify further where we need to go next, okay? Mm -hmm. So the idea, as I told you, just started out of nowhere, really. But mm -hmm. uh, you're the guys who are taking it where it has to go. Do we have a... Question? No. It's, well, we're just sort of... No. This is sort of... Uh, I just wanted you to... Do, okay, that was the first one. Um, <laughs> again, this, okay, so there'll be a lot of editing in this video. <laughs> um, but the next is, uh, what challenges have you had in this? And so, I know that the Brock Prize is here to promote the best ideas in education, um, but what are the challenges that you face in operating? So, in other words, you might, uh, let me change that just a little bit. What doesn't work? So okay. one of you start, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so like the challenges, um, the kids want to always be on the computer. They love the computer. So the challenges, you know, let me be on the computer. I want to be, because it's their decision to say who's going to do the research, who's going to do the writing, who's going to do, you know, um, in our in our soul, they like to do they like to draw. So who's going to be the artist? Everybody wants to be on the computer because they can look and they can they can go through. Um, the challenges would be having the children rotate job duties when the program starts, um, letting them take turns, you know, and remember. Okay, last week I did this part. Let me do this other part. So everybody gets a chance to do the research, everybody gets the chance to be the artist. Um, everybody gets a chance to speak. You know, everybody has their speaking part. Um, what doesn't work, you know, as a teacher, we have to make everything work. Yes. <laughs> you know, we, we make everything work. You know, if, if this is, if you're having a, a problem over here, then we'll find some way to fix the problem or to make everybody be included in the program. The whole part of SOUL is to make sure everybody is included, to make sure that they're enjoying themselves, and everybody get a chance to do 
the research and the speaking and the writing and the drawing. We want everybody to participate. That way they have a whole education experience of teaching one another. Can I just say something about that? Uh, I think she just articulated the problem from a position of like, she is definitely not the problem. <laughs> These two educators <laughs> up here, like they just, uh, like they, she just described the process of solving a problem that it emerges when you realize there's a gap between what kids know and what mm -hmm. they need to know. And she described that in the context of collaboration, which is one of the concepts that um, we know is critical for success in this world, no matter what you're doing but it's typically not part of the science curriculum or the math curriculum or the social studies curriculum. So one of the problems really is how do you like ask educators to engage in that kind of work while also asking them to teach these subject areas that they know they have to teach because there's these standardized tests or things coming down the pike that they have to be responsible for. And so when you get them to do that uh, in a soul, uh, the first time they try it, it's not gonna go great. Uh, and she just described the things that she recognized from the first time to the third time to the fifth time and how she like worked through that. Um, one of the challenges is getting people to appreciate that just because the kids didn't know how to share the computer appropriately the first time doesn't mean you should quit. You know, it, it's just it's showing you what they don't know how to do and showing you where the opportunities for learning are. I think too often we ask teachers when we're talking about self um, self-organized learning or any kind of student-centered inquiry. We ask them to do too much too fast. And because of that, the effort that goes into starting and the effort that goes into like getting all the things you need to do it are so great, no one wants to do that again. It feels horrible. The kids don't like it, the teachers don't like it. But with Soul, like, she described a process that happens every Friday for one class period. And because of their commitment to it, they can, they can teach kids how to grow to that while they're answering questions like, why do humans walk on two legs, how much science is in that? I mean, there's even some math that was in some of the things that they were talking about today. While they were learning how to collaborate and communicate and think critically, all the things we know that need to be uh, embedded into the educational environment today. So sorry, I, I went too long probably, but no. no. no fine. And now when we're like, okay, y'all, let's do so. Yeah. And, oh yeah, let's go, can we do math? Can we do, you know? Mm -hmm. So now it's to the point where they're picking their questions as far as, let's do something on science. Okay, well, we'll go and we'll pick a question. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, can we do math next week? Sure, no problem. Mm -hmm. And I'll go find math question. We also integrate grades. So I have fifth grade and fourth grade. They're working together. Yeah. You know, they're, they're you know, learning from one another. They love going with the other class. We're out in the big room like this, and we give them the paper, the question, and they just go for it. And they, they like it. They really enjoy it. And this, of course, like I said, they love to socialize. <laughs> <laughs> so they're definitely socializing while learning. Well, I, I need to uh, I'll add one more thing I've seen is uh, that, you know, firstly, uh, since you do it once a week, that, that's good frequency. Mm -hmm. Imagine if every teacher, if, had, if, if the principal had made it compulsory that a soul should be done every day, or something like that, then what happens, and I've seen this happen in, in schools, it gets jaded. It gets jaded to a point where a teacher walks into the classroom, today's question is, she writes mm -hmm. on the blackboard and then sits down, and the children, they just type the question into Google, the first thing that comes up, they copy it onto a piece of paper, and we're finished, and then start playing games. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that's, that's absolutely the wrong way. You have to engage them with the question and you have to do souls not all the time for everything, mm -hmm. but sometimes. And one more thing I've noticed which uh, teachers uh, find difficult, sometimes you have a child who uh, is alone, doesn't want to join any group, okay? Mm -hmm. It's really difficult. And, and you know, in England, teachers used to say, what should I say, should I tell him? You must join, and, and I, I felt that's not fair, because you know that child may not be joining a group on that particular day because there's a problem of some sort. There's a problem at home, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to treat that with understanding. But what I use and I find works quite well is I appoint an assistant out of the children. I say, who will be my assistant today? And then we get somebody to be my assistant. They decide who the assistant is. When I notice a problem like this, like a child is not engaging, I call my assistant. 
I said, who's that? You know, I don't know all of you too well, but uh, why, why is he not joining any group? And you would be surprised. Nine times out of ten, th that child, my assistant, she or he knows the answer. They know each other. They know what are the reasons. And they would say, well, you know, there was a problem this morning or whatever. Stuff which I would have never come to know. So this assistant works quite well to sort out these problems. Yes. I think when you first start, like it's going to look chaotic, but you have to keep trying, keep trying. Like trying to think about challenges that when we first did it to now, it's much smoother because we kept trying. Like find one task each week that you want to strengthen, that you want to get better with. And like she said, at first, the school year just started for us. On the first day, they're like, no. But now they are excited to do it, excited to get together and collaborate and learn from one another. So I would say if you do it, just keep there's going to be challenges, but find a way next time to how can I do this better? How can I incorporate something different? Because how we do so looks a little bit different between how they um, tell you all about so. It looks different. <laughs> it looks different from how we do it. All right. Well, this is this is working really well. Um, the, we got. I have more questions now than uh, I did before I started, so now my problem is I have too many questions right now. But uh, I, I, one of the questions is, and, and I, probably anybody up here can answer it, uh, not all of you have to answer it, but what's the difference between soul and problem-based learning? Jeff, I'll let you start with that because you mentioned that yeah. in several of your uh, talks today. It's a good question, and uh, on one hand, there's no difference in a lot of ways, soul is a version of problem-based learning, but on the other hand, there's lots of other versions of problem-based learning that exist. So, you know, it, it would be like, um, you know, it's a, a Cadillac. A Cadillac is a car. There's other types of cars. Soul is the Cadillac of cars, just like um, a problem-based learning is a version of that. I don't know, does that make sense? Sure. Um, how would you apply soul to a college-level mathematics course? Sure. Go yeah, for go it. ahead. Go for it. When, oh. <laughs> <laughs> when you are getting on soul and you do start live soul, there are questions there that you can choose if you don't know a question yourself. And it ranges. It, where did it go Kin to? Kindergarten. High Kindergarten school. all the way up to Go high school. So if you don't, it can, or even you can come up with your own question when it comes to math. I know we're doing subtraction. Why do we use subtraction? You know, um, how do you solve this subtraction problem? That's elementary. That's kind of little. <laughs> that is, that is, See, yeah. You got it, though. Like, I would say, <laughs> like, look at your curriculum and look at where there's opportunities to infuse big questions into your curriculum if they're not there already. Yeah. And then look at how much time you have with your students and, and partition off a little bit of that, you know, at maybe at the beginning of units or something where it makes sense to be asking a big question that allows them to kind of like explore. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, 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 also for, uh, you know, university style math, uh, math is actually a great subject uh, with unanswered questions in it. There have been questions in math which have not found an answer in hundreds and hundreds of years. So you could pose it as a question, yeah. well, how come nobody could solve this? What's so what's so peculiar about you know whatever uh, Fermat's last theorem or something like that? Uh, wh uh, you start getting the excitement out of that, and then you you get into the nitty gritty of math. So I wouldn't use a soul in mathematics to to actually learn a process. That's the boring part of math. But I would use a soul to generate the romance of mathematics. Nice. I think <clears throat> that is pretty good. And one thing I think that Lenora was saying is that, or alluding to, is that there is a bank of questions. Uh, one of the questions here is how do you get the questions, the big questions? And actually what Jeff has put together in Start Soul is this network of people all over the world that put their questions in this bank. And so you have, uh, you have these questions that people have used, 
how successful they've been, and those kind of things. One of the questions I just saw today, we were talking to a mathematics, uh, uh, a teacher prep mathematics class. Why, why are numbers important? And so, you know, maybe out of the boring, you know, subtraction and the multiplication, and just sort of stop and say, why is this even important? Let's do a soul. And so. Can I just say something about the questions? Yeah. Because uh, we do, we have a, a database, of, we kind of crowdsource questions and it's, you know, it's, everything's free so people put things on and ev others can use them. But the best questions usually come from the kids. <laughs> like, like the best questions that I've heard are when teachers or when we, you listen to what the questions the kids have about the things that you're talking about. Yeah, well that's one way. The other, other method which I sometimes use myself is uh, to to ask uh, to to think like a nine year old, okay, and, and 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 you repeatedly ask questions. You know the way it goes is that you, you tell this nine year old, uh, put on your jumper. The nine year old says why, and you say because it's getting cold. So why is it getting cold? Because winter's coming. Why does winter keep coming every year? Because there are seasons and they, and, and why do seasons repeat? Oh, because the earth goes around the sun. Why does the earth go around, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? If you do this about 15 times, you'll hit a big question. One to which no one knows the answer. <laughs> and that actually happens in class. It, <laughs> it calls for a more in-depth conversation. Mm -hmm. They're like diving deep, you know, and then we're sitting there like, oh, okay, <laughs> yeah. well, good job. And you can see them back there high-fiving because they're actually <laughs> engaged yeah. and they're engaging one another. Mm -hmm. So it goes into a little bit more of, okay, so why does that happen? And it, it just opens their minds up to more thinking, mm -hmm. critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. One, one thing that I've noticed about it too, it, what Tana is saying, it provides opportunities for encouraging students. One of the things that the biggest part in anyone's education is encouragement. Just a little encouragement along the way, go, or a little encouragement goes a long ways. And this particular process allows for a lot of encouragement during that time. Okay, and I think any of you might be able to answer this one. This is one that, one of those that may or may not even have an answer. But uh, I know that in Drexel, and not only Drexel, but literacy is at the top of the list of things to improve. And after the learning loss uh, during the COVID pandemic, uh, I don't know of a school where literacy is not at the top of the list. And so what are your thoughts on the future of traditional literacy with the emerging digital technology that we have? And so Sugata, maybe I'll start with you on that. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's actually, a rather strange answer. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if I'm right, but as teachers, uh, you might be able to get a sense of what I'm saying. Literacy to us usually meant understanding a language, being able to read, write, etc. You know, it's possible for a child today to grow up without knowing how to read and write. Now, that sounds horrible. Mm -hmm. Because you immediately think of the you know the developing countries, and yes, we've been there before, and we've seen these children who've got no education. Don't compare. Don't compare with the 21st century. Mm -hmm. They talk to their phones, mm -hmm. and the phones reply. The internet can see, the internet can hear, the internet can speak, and maybe the internet can think. And I know there are computer scientists who will say, or maybe it's just pretending to do all of these things. But I know one thing for sure, we have to prepare our children to answer that question. Is it pretending or is this for real? That sort of gets into one question about uh, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. Can Has there been any, any instances where soul has been used in, um, let's see, let me get the question right. Um, in your observations about how self-organized learning might have hold promise for the deployment of AR, VR, uh, augmented learning or virtual reality, Aug augmented reality or virtual reality. 
Well, I, mean, I think it's, it's just the it's just beginning. I mean, even the game companies are just about getting into AR, VR. Uh, 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 my first question or my first doubt, uh, no, not doubt, my first question, you know those headsets? Uh, they have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. they're, they're unnatural. I mean, if, if I was in a school and, and if some... Buddy said, you know, buy 30 of those and have all the children wearing those things and wandering around. I would say, come on, I mean, give me a break. So that, that <laughs> kind. We know those things need to become better. We, we need something which looks like normal, you know, eyeglasses or something like that. And then it will come, like all other technologies, it will come with its associated problems. Um, right now, you would look at a child and say, what are you looking at? Uh, with those glasses on, that question will change to, where are you? Mm -hmm. okay, that's scary. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things, we have a lot of uh, people in higher education here today. Not everyone, but quite a few from, the, from our College of Education and Human, Human Sciences. So, um, and this says this goes for Jeff or the Drexel teachers, but what could we do in educator preparation to better prepare educators to implement soul or this type of learning? So, yeah. You want to take it first or do you want to? Oh, yeah. Well, um, what, what could we do to prepare pre-service educators? Yeah, or to better, to help, <clears throat> I mean, so many of the people here right. are teacher prep educators. And so, how can we, as, say, the College of Education and Human Sciences, yeah. uh, what are things that we can implement college-wide or in different courses mm -hmm. to help in that yeah. preparation? That's awesome question. Um, the school I started in Cleveland was somewhat of a lab school with Cleveland State. The 11th and 12th graders actually were on Cleveland State's campus for their like home base. They were all over the city doing internships and getting credit in lots of different ways, but their home base was the campus. And so we had a lot of pre-service teachers in the school at all three of the locations. Ninth grade was in the Science Center, 10th grade was at GE's World Headquarters for Lighting, and 11th, 12th grade was the campus. One of the things that um, we struggled with at first was a lot of times they weren't getting into our classrooms in the, into the field part of it till late in their educational uh, experiences. And I don't know if that's the case here or not, but one of the things that um, that caused was people were getting pretty far into the program and they weren't good teachers. And they didn't have the dispositions to really become good teachers, but they'd spent three years in a teacher education program before they had gotten to that point, and they invested so much time and energy, it was really hard to tell them do something else. Um, one of the things that I like about Seoul is th that you could get into a classroom your first year, your first semester, facilitate a Seoul session with kids and really experience what it feels like to, to be the facilitator of a student-centered uh, inquiry-based environment, and then iterate that process regularly and reflect on it and grow. And, and so, you know, I would say one of the things is look at your, your entry programs and look at your methods, classes, and where these things fit and, and um, encourage your, stu your students to get into the field and do this work with students. And even maybe before that, encourage them to do it with each other as part of the class, because mm -hmm. uh, it would work with in that setting too. So it really gives you a practical way to really engage in the in the you know the practice of teaching with your students early on, and then I mean there's lots of other ways that you can take it from there, but I think it's just really low hanging fruit in that particular area because it is so um, uh, you don't need a lot of you don't need a fab lab to do a soul session in the classroom. You just need access to technology that's connected to the internet with screens big enough so that you can see what's going on. You need a big question, and you need kids in groups like so like you could pretty much tell a student uh, in your program to go anywhere in the area, and they probably have access to that, those resources there that you can use. Okay, very good. Uh, Anybody else want to say anything? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, as, this is my 18th year teaching. So uh, it's, an it's very important on getting kids engaged. You know, what's going to make it fun, what's going to make it interesting, because that's what, that is what's going to make them listen. Um, there's no right or wrong way to do it. Like you said, I take the question, present it, and then 
let them go for it. Um, they're more engaging when they have less rules and standards. They're more active when they don't have, okay, you got to do this, 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 and this. They're more engaged. You know, they'll pay more attention. They, um, that's just my opinion, you know, with teaching with four, nine and 10 year olds for 18 <laughs> years. Um, just something to keep them engaged, make it fun, make it interesting. And we kind of take it, like we were given how to do it, but we kind of take it and make it our own, give it a little twist, you know, because not all kids are going to, you know, do it the same way. Um, and I, I believe the way we do it is a good way, you know. It it's effective. Yeah. Um, we encourage the kids. And now it's to the point, we've done it so long, now it's to the point we could just sit back <laughs> and watch. You know, when they came this morning, we just sat back and watched. Uh, Dr. Sugata was walking around, and I said, look look at him just walking around. We're just sitting back and watching because <laughs> they know what to do. And, um, you know, we do have to kind of guide them, you know, make sure, hey, stay on task. You only got a few minutes. Pay attention. <laughs> we did have to do that a couple of times, but for the most part, they did it. Yeah. And we try to make it fun and interesting because that's what's going to keep them engaged and keep them going for the time period that we have. So if we can set the question for 30 minutes, we can set it for 40 minutes. Um, we give them two minutes, uh, two minutes to decide amongst the group. Our groups consist of four to five students in a group, and we give them two minutes, and it's a time on the TV. We give them two minutes, and in that two minutes, they can decide, okay, I want to do the research. I want to draw. Okay, can I help do this? After the two minutes, uh, then the time pops back on the TV and says you have 37 minutes to do your research. So 37 minutes, they're researching, they're writing, they write the question down, um, we want their names on the paper, you know. We have guidelines, but we kind of let them, you know, do everything and we give them markers so they can pick the color of the markers they want to use. And then uh, they have to have a timekeeper so someone keeps up with the time. When it gets close to two minutes, you can hear them say, we got two minutes, come on. So now they know to start wrapping it up, finishing off their writing. They get to draw pictures. They get to color on the paper. And by the end of the time, you know, we want them sitting ready to present. And that's what they like because they're guiding their own learning. And we're like, okay, good job. <laughs> can, can I add something else real quick? So, like, the, your pre-service teachers need to get into their classrooms and see it in action, too. And we need to have more classrooms in the area where their, their model environments where kids can go in and see this while they're getting their education and into, into that field, too. And there's, there's no reason why, um, you know, p other educators shouldn't be coming into their classrooms and learning from them and learning from the work that they're doing. And a network of those types of schools exists in, in Ohio because that's where we started. And then... Uh, the last three years I've been working with the state of Pennsylvania to intentionally create those kind of like hubs in different areas where people can go and get trained and can see other teachers and, and create this network where, um, you know, we don't have to worry that if a, if a pre-service teacher is going out from Oklahoma State uh, to a school, uh, you know, they might be the only one doing it there because there's people in the schools now that would, would do great with this and the tools and the resources are there for them to do it for free. So, so one thing I hear you saying here, um, at least I'm interpreting that it'd be good for uh, the College of uh, Education and Human Sciences to partner with some schools like Drexel um, and uh, Stillwater Public School, who's planning on implementing a lot of, I know firsthand uh, that. And so that uh, that's sort of in the, because she's the person overseeing that is here today. And so, um, but, um, but yeah, to do that to where it's not like, um, the, the, for us, I can say this because I've, I've been in the ivory tower for a long time. It's not to get even students out of this environment into the real world, real world of education and to see it going on because it's contagious. One of the things that, that sort of a unintended, it may be an intended, but I call it an unintended consequence is the transformation of the entire culture of a school and we can see this at Drexel Academy. Today, when this was going on, the president, uh, uh, Tim Newton, went over to me and he goes, this is the time of the week that I enjoy the most 
because we looked across this open area, almost as big as this. Kids were laying on the floor, one, you know, about four grouped at four, and you could feel the, the culture, the climate of that particular environment. Literally, you can, you can feel it. And he goes, I love this. I get calm, uh, regardless if I'm uptight about something, this calms me down just to be in this environment. And it does. It, it has that kind of effect. Um, I, I have a question that I even know the answer to to this one, but I'm, I'm going to wait here before I answer. But um, can it work in environments that are completely online, completely virtual environments? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I think it will be it will be good to work online. I think it can work online because online you can go out into breakout groups. You can yeah. put um, the students out in breakout groups, and then you can bring them back in once the time is done, and and then reconvene and talk about, um, and they can discuss the question just as if they were at school. They're just online, mm -hmm. so you can do the same thing online just break them out in groups and bring them back and i just want to mention one thing that our school is pre-k through fifth grade we even have the pre-kers doing it and the kindergartners and the first graders mm -hmm. and they're doing it now they're not writing like you know the big kids are writing but they're drawing pictures they're coloring they're doing the same thing so by the time they get to fifth grade and fourth grade smooth sailing so That's our whole school is incorporating. And we have them, it's like we do it in teams. So we have pre-K and third grade. So each teacher, each grade has a team that they do it with. And even though that they are pre-K, you can implement it to how it can work with someone that small or a kindergarten as well. Like they can get in on the conversation as well. It doesn't have to be a difficult question. It can be a lower level question where everyone is able to participate in the uh, in the soul as well. So yes, it can work online. Okay. Yes, yeah, well, that's a kind of, kind of fascinating. And uh, during COVID, uh, mm -hmm. uh, on, online obviously be, uh, sort of was forced upon us. So I was sitting in India at that time. I was locked down in India for almost 18 months. And uh, I got invited to many of these online soul sessions with the breakout rooms that you mentioned. And uh, I still remember in one of them, they had given me permission to go into any of the breakout mm -hmm. rooms to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. And there I was, and there were all these students sort of chatting, and they were from all sorts of countries and everywhere because of the nature of the internet. They can be anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I sort of walked in, I was watching one of the breakout rooms and what's going on when on the internet, and this is how the internet differs, somebody said, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I said, who are you? <laughs> and he said, well, if you don't know what a soul is, that's what we're doing right now. <laughs> and I said, okay, got it. So that's how it's going to work on the cloud. <laughs> so, so yes, it, it works, it works well. But you just have to take into account that the internet is a different yeah. place yeah. From, from the classroom. So it has its own norms. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm getting questions so fast I can't keep up with them here. So we will, I'm trying to screen some of, um, some of these. Um, oh, one, I think one is important because we have a, a variety of, of people represented here. Uh, many, many and maybe mostly public school uh, people, is there a difference in adoption rates in public schools versus private schools? And either, so I'm sure, I mean, in your work with Start Soul, uh, Jeff, what have you found? Yeah, uh, the the platform, when people sign up, it tells you which school they're at and when they're, where they're uh, doing this. So I haven't actually, like, looked into the data specifically to, to parse that question out. I have recently seen... Uh, I mean, there's literally, I think, close to 14,000 educators in Ohio on the platform now. So it's, it's making its way through Ohio pretty like dramatically. Uh, the private schools in the Cleveland area weren't some of the first adopters. They're now, like, they're now uh, adopting pretty rapidly. Uh, but that, 
I don't know overall like if there's a difference, um, but anecdotally, the last month or so, the, the adoption rate in the in the private schools in Cleveland has started to go way up. And I think uh, what I'm hearing from them is there's certain dollars that they're getting uh, tied to this kind of work, uh, inquiry based, and in, and they're coming to it because it fits into their model. But I don't know overall. It's something I could find out, but it's not something I have at the top of my head. But you were, I guess, when you first started working, it was primarily with public schools, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I'm a public school educator at heart, so that's typically where I end up gravitating to naturally. My parents were both public school educators as well, so, uh, and I was in the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. So the first network we really kind of like got into, obviously, was the Cleveland schools. But then what happened right away after that was Ohio has a network of regional centers that provide professional development to the teachers in their area, and a couple of those started to pick it up. And once they got uh, uh, up in it and started training, they started providing training to all the educators in their areas. And the same thing happened in Pennsylvania. So there was probably an imbalance of like access to public school educators based on the networks we were getting into um, at first. And like I said, I think that's kind of starting to like come around a little bit. This, this goes to all of you, and uh, I think it's a great question. What have you learned about yourselves from being in the soul experiences that you didn't realize before? Okay, I'll go. You can tell I'm getting a little more comfortable. <laughs> First, I was sweating. <laughs> I'm definitely getting a little more comfortable. Um, you know, I've learned that you just got to go with the flow. You know, it's, you know... It's, it's not, you know, like st structured, you know, this way, this way, on this day, this day. You know, you just got to kind of give them the question and let it go. If it gets chaotic, Dr. Sugata said this morning, if it gets chaotic, it's okay. It's okay. You know, we've done it for a while, so it's kind of more contained a little bit. But I, he told me this morning, if it gets chaotic, it's okay. So I've learned to just let them go for it, you know, just have fun. We'll come back, we'll talk about it in 40 minutes. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, so I've definitely learned that, you know, you give students, as a teacher, you give students something they're going to learn. They come to school to learn. Um, I would say 80% want to learn something, you know, so you give them something, they're going to learn it. You tell them what to do, they're going to do it. You tell them how to do it, they're going to take it and make it their own. Um, but they definitely want to learn. And I think whether it's in a public school, a private school, a charter school, I think they will enjoy doing so because it gives them freedom range to just learn. And, you know, all different, all students learn on different levels, different ways. Some are visual, some are hands-on. This gives you both. It gives you both visual and hands-on. Just go for it. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I can generalize that to what I learned uh, through all these years of souls is that, you know, the, the teacher's job um, in my kind of schooling, uh, the old style schooling, the teacher's job was an architect's job. You planned out, I'm, this is what I'm going to make this young man into. This is what I'm going to make this young lady into. Okay, and then you work on it like an architect. You build people. It's changed. Mm. It's changed to a gardener's job. The difference between an architect's job and a gardener's job is that the architect makes things happen. The gardener lets things happen. And it's a very vital difference. And I think we should, we, all of us teachers will agree, children are not buildings. Children are more like plants. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to nurture them, and let them grow. Mm -hmm. So, in a soul, uh, what you said that's uh, you know that when it's chaotic, let it be. Yeah. So, got the, I'd like to take that analogy a little bit further because uh, <laughs> because usually for um, for educators who built their entire career on the architect model, it could be very scary to try this new thing. And so, um, you know, in other words, if I, if you, it's, if the art of teaching is asking the right questions, what, I mean, I may not be needed 
in the future. But the garden, the garden uh, analogy is really important because a garden still needs a gardener, and but it's a different responsibility and, and have different roles. Um, it's cultivation, seed planting, and it's a different type of organization than it is as an architect. So um, anyway, I like that garden analogy. Anybody else? I would say um, I, I'm an alumni from Oral Roberts, so I know different schools teach different things. So from the education department there, learning is conversational. And so before I started, before I chose to become a teacher, I was in TPS and I was used to one structured way. And then when I went to Oral Roberts, they're like, oh, they just talk and they learn, you know, you got to have a conversation. I'm like, no, that is not what's supposed to happen. <laughs> no. But really, truly, truly seeing that, okay, the students can get together in the group and have a conversation where I don't have to be, I think that's my first year I thought, okay, I have to be structured to, okay, no, it's okay to not have like loosen the reins a little bit like they are still learning and like he said it does get chaotic and you feel like okay are you learning something like did you get something and the students actually do take a lot away like they do versus me standing up there and just explicitly giving that instruction so being okay that it's learning in the conversation, even though they get off task. And like he said this morning, it's okay, it's going to get chaotic. I'm like, okay, they're chaotic. They can, you know, you give them an inch, they're going to take a mile. Mm -hmm. But, like, that is okay. It's okay not to be, be quiet. Listen to me. I have it. Like, you can learn from one another. It can be conversational. All right, very good. Um, I, I want to be uh, considerate of everyone's time here. Also, one thing unusual about this time, I know that uh, you, one reason you came is uh, to see Sugata Mitra and to possibly meet him. Um, there's, always been, there's already been a lot of uh, photos taken today with, with uh, faculty members in Sugata. And uh, so I want to I wanna sort of end on this question. And by the way, I... So for, your, for the virtual audience and the, uh, the live audience, I want to thank you so much for the questions. Uh, I touched on just a fraction of the number of questions that we had. And by the way, uh, Cindy texted me on here and said, by the way, this is the most that we've ever got in any of our, in the, all the symposiums that we've had. And so maybe all of them put together. And so... Uh, Again, this little experiment that I did sort of worked, right? Sort of took a little, took a little gamble. We don't have to edit too much here, <laughs> Cindy. All right. So I, I sort of want to end on, and by the way, I want to thank all of you for being here, but I want to end with Sagata. This is an important question. This has sort of been a journey for you, even when you put out the first uh computer in the hole in the wall. It's sort of like it, was, it wasn't all mapped out before this all happened, but at the same time, you have seen this experiment moving. How would you like to see it? Where, or let me, or where would you like to see this go? You know, I, I wish the answer was that I would like to see a, a wonderful new world with, you know, children, happy children living wonderful, happy lives. But I'm, I'm afraid that uh, that's not how I, I look at it. I look at it as a series of questions. Started with a few questions. I went on answering. The more I answered, the more questions kept coming up. How does this work? How does that work? more and more. Right now in front of me, there are also stretching out a very large number of questions. So how do I look at it? Well, 
I'm just going to try and keep answering them until I can't anymore. All right. It's a good way to, to end. And uh, so we're, we're going to keep up with your journey, and uh, we're gonna, we want to go along with it with, with you. We, we had a conversation last night about um, the importance of, of, putting, of allowing adventure to come in your life. And this whole way of teaching is a way of inviting adventure to come in. And so, uh, Sugata, we want to be with you in this journey. We want to we want to see the adventure that's ahead. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Again. And so, let's also have a round of applause for our unscripted uh, panelists here. Yeah. So, thank you. <laughs> so, um, let's see. Okay. Okay, your, your input is, I got so involved in the questions, I forgot my script here. Okay, your input's uh, really important. We encourage you to use the QR code uh, on screen to link to a brief survey. For those of you at the live event, you'll find the code at the handout on your seat, or you can actually maybe find it there. We'll use your feedback to improve future Brock events. We really take, these, take your feedback important. Uh, 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 seriously, and we try to adjust every time. And so we try to get better every time we do this. So I'd like to recognize several individuals who have contributed greatly in the planning and development of this year's symposium. Uh, Provost Mendez, Dean Peterson, I want to thank you so much for giving us your best in preparing for this. Also, uh, Chris Ormsby, I don't know if Chris is here, but thank you so much for ITLE, what all you've done there and your leadership and just allowing these great people uh, to be a part of, of what we're doing. Uh, Harley, Christy, JD, Wade, and uh, the group, all of you, I thank you so much. And uh, as always, I thank my team, and this will not be long here, uh, Kate and Cindy, thank you. That's my team, and I thank you so much for all you do. So uh, thank you, all of you who joined us today in celebrating this afternoon. Uh, please remember, John Brock says this often, the most important thing we do in life is educate our children. And so let's keep that in mind. So drive carefully. Uh, go, po go Pokes, Golden Hurricanes, and Sooners. We have at least one Sooner here. And uh, we want to make sure we're, we're inclusive uh, of all people, so we re we even welcome Sooners here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so y'all drive carefully. Thank you for joining us. Guess we can turn on the lights and people can meet Sugata. <laughs>